hello. And welcome again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly talk show on the Fab Four in which we talk about anything we feel like. It could be about the past, the present, and even sometimes the future here on this show. You never know from one program to the next what subject we'll be tackling. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four regular co-hosts of this show, also known for my syndicated Beatles show, which is called Davy Little Thing, being joined by my three other regular co-hosts. First of all, we have longtime contributing writer uh, to Beatle Fan Magazine, Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. Also one of the writers for Beatle Fan, and he writes for many other publications, known for many years writing uh, for the classical department for the New York Times, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also we have Steve Marinucci. He writes for Beatles Examiner and many other Examiner columns, Beatles Examiner being the number one news source for Beatle fans online. Hi, hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Before we get into our show today, um, I thought that we'd mention that we have a brand new affiliate. Yay! (laughs) Yay! uh, Yay. And it happens to be an online uh, internet station, WCPR, which you can reach at WCPR1.com. They'll be carrying things we said today on Thursdays, and the time will be at 9 Eastern Time. They're also going to repeat the show on Fridays, 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., and then the show will be available on demand on Saturday. So in addition to Fab Four Radio and um, Pure Pop Radio, we also have WCPR. So thank you guys for taking our show, and uh, welcome aboard, and thanks so much. Yay! Yay! (laughs) So, on today's program, we have a special guest with us, and he's Gary Jacob. Gary is the organizer for Abbey Road on the River. This is a uh, Beatles festival that takes place every single year, and I do believe there's, there's several going on each year. But uh, we're going to be talking to him about the whole history of Abbey Road on the River. And uh, the upcoming one, the one that's about to happen this month, as a matter of fact, will be... May the 26th through the 30th at the Belvedere Festival Park. That's in Louisville, Kentucky. So we welcome Gary Jacob to Things We Said Today. Hi, Gary. Hello, Ken and Al, Alan and Steve. Thank you for inviting me on tonight. Thank you. Well, we've heard about Abbey Road on the River for many years now. And in fact, I was there at uh, one of your festivals back in 2010. That was in Washington, D.C. Just want to start the conversation off by asking just the general question of how this whole thing started and what have you done with Abbey Road on the River? I'm sure you're aware of all the other Beatle festivals that take place around the world, especially the Fest for Beatle fans and also the annual one that takes place in Liverpool the end of August every single year. What did you do when you started this to try to differentiate it from the other festivals? Well, I think that every year that might be towards the top of the list of what we do think about, because, you know, without being, you know, too aggrandizing about it, we we think about it the way the Beatles evolved, that if you you still you have to evolve whatever type of festival you're going to create. And in our case, it was always what can we do with the music to make it more interesting, because Obviously, the music speaks for itself, but if you play, you know, the same 20 songs over and over again all the time, it could get a little boring. So from the beginning, I think our mission was we didn't want to be a Star Trek style convention. We didn't want to be an Elvis style convention. And we really wanted to focus on the music, maybe in the way that, you know, George Martin re-engineered love. We wanted to be able to re-engineer the way people heard Beatles music. Hmm. That's an interesting analogy right there. One of the things that, that I find fascinating about going to your festival is that you've got bands from all over the world, really. And, you know, you can have any type of format in these bands. They could be strictly Beatles. They can be strictly solo Beatles. I've even seen a, a Traveling Wilburys band there. So um, was that the intention when you first started doing this festival? Well, we knew the first, the very first year the original idea was actually to make a competition. Uh, uh, the original idea was let's find out who the best Beatles band in the world is. But when we got into the planning for that back in 01, quickly we realized that 
nobody wanted to be in an American Idol type contest if they were a commercial band, that there would be a bigger stake in losing than in winning, I guess. Mm -hmm. So we quickly decided that it had to be a music festival. But I was I had been producing big food and music festivals, mostly in Cleveland. And I would always bring in major entertainment for these festivals that uh, might have been the entertainment of the day, from Gloria Estefan to uh, Willie Nelson, Bad English. It, you know, we were always bringing in big acts, but we would always have a secondary stage and uh, do a Beatles cover band. Actually, if I could digress for a moment, I owned a restaurant in Cleveland through the late 70s and early 80s. And in 1984, for the 20th anniversary, I decided to turn my restaurant into a two-week Beatle extravaganza. Now, this was a fine dining restaurant that had a downstairs basement disco-style lounge. And uh, I was, I guess, kind of obsessed with the 20th anniversary. If, as you recall, you, you know, when Rolling Stone uh, certainly brought it to the forefront, and the 20th was a pretty big deal. But now that we all look at the 40th and 50th, we forget how big the 20th was, but it was big. Right. And uh, so at that time, 1964 had just began as a band, and they were called Revolver. And they lived in Akron, Ohio, as you know. And uh, I recruited them to play in my restaurant after the restaurant dining room closed every night for two weeks. And it was a happening. I mean, I, I remember traffic being lined up all around the corners for people to come in to this small hundred seat restaurant to see what was then known as revolver every night and then i just let go of it for a long time but i would occasionally bring a beatles band to these other festivals and they would always outdraw or equally draw the acts that we had paid fifty thousand dollars for wow <laughs> so certainly it was always in my mind that beatles bands and beatles music was a great attraction. So in 01, the uh, West Bank of the Flats in Cleveland is known as Nautica, and it's owned by the Jacobs family that, uh, not to be confused with me, is I'm Jacob, are the people who used to own the Cleveland Indians. And uh, mm -hmm. you remember when Progressive Stadium was called the Jake. Right. Mm -hmm. So Jeff Jacobs owns a entertainment complex on the west side of the Flats known as Nautica, and in 2001, they started planning the redesign of their 4,000-seat uh, amphitheater, where Ringo himself has now played, I think, three or four times over the years. And they came to me because I had done a lot of events with them and asked me if I had any ideas for a grand opening. And at that time, I said, I think a contest for the best Beatle band in the world would be fun. And they said, let's do it. And that evolved into searching for a name for the festival, which in and of itself is a great story. And um, and then we launched it in August of 02 at the Nautica Amphitheater. And uh, that bring you know, I'll wait for your next question. How much more of that minutiae you want to hear? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that you mentioned the story about the name. That sounds, yeah. sounds like Yes. Fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So with the name, uh, I, I sent out an email to... I don't know, maybe 50 people I knew at the time that I thought were, you know, from different genres, whether it be entertainment or whatever, and um, said to them, I'm, I'm going to start this Beatles festival, and, you know, I, I'm looking for a name, and I got back all the usual suspects of, you know, Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane Fest and things like that, and they were all, you know, good, but, you know, we were on a river. The Cuyahoga River is where the Nautica Amphitheater is. And uh, a woman that I used to work with on a tour that we did for American Movie Classics, we had done a, a year before, we had done a tour for American Movie Classics celebrating fashion and film. And uh, she just wrote back the words, Abbey Road on the river. And it was one of those, for me, cosmic moments where I knew that I now had a festival. That this name would be, the, you know, almost like an inheritance something that you know we were given a, a we had to really handle with care if you will and, uh, mm -hmm. and and over the years i've always said that i thought that the name was the best thing that we had 
the name has a really nice feel to it. And, and mm-hmm. not only that, once you hear it, you remember it. Right. Yeah, I think we got very lucky with the name. Yeah. And it was during the time that we got the name that the other festival was going through its name changes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we, we, we just steer clear of the traffic. You know, it's as you know, there can be a lot of traffic in that world. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and I, I of course, went to uh, the fest in, Jer- in Jersey in 02. And uh, if, if Mark or his family are listening, I apologize. But I, I waited until four in the morning, even though nobody goes to bed. And I ran through the hallways and I slipped flyers under every door. <laughs> promoting the first Abbey Road on the river and uh, I felt so clandestine about it but I had no choice but to get the word out mm. and uh, sure. yeah, so that's how uh, it all started well you couldn't find a better audience for that than right there it was yeah. fun yeah, a few, there were a lot of uh, I, I remember going to it and being nervous as I because I had a few people that I already knew there but not that many Matter of fact, uh, full disclosure, uh, I always say that I kind of come with the furniture at the fest. I've been involved with it for many, many years. But uh, for various and sundry reasons, I've never been to Abbey Road on the River. Now, for somebody who has never been, who has been to other conventions, who has been to the fest or has been to other, you know, other Beatles conventions, perhaps to Liverpool – how would you describe Abbey Road on the River for a first, a potential first-time attendee? Well, we're a music festival. Right. And, and it is that much different. Now, I realize that the fest now has a lot of music, and of course Liverpool has a tremendous amount of music. music. Right. We, we really more resemble a music festival. I mean, we're... We're not Bonnaroo, but we're a small Bonnaroo. I remember the Dallas Morning News year, about five years ago wrote a story about small but mighty festivals. And they listed us first because that's what we are. We have 10 stages and 50, 60, 70 bands and 250 concerts. That's a lot of music. Mm-hmm. And sometimes fans that are familiar with the fest that go to that every year for the last 40 years mm-hmm. don't like what we offer because we are not um, deep enough into the subject, you know, that we are more surface in, in terms of just coming and letting go and getting in front of the stage and dancing and having camaraderie with other like-minded Beatles music. And while we do have lectures and discussions and we do, you know, enjoy having them, we go out of our way to make sure we don't have too many. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that we make sure that we always just become this playground, a place where people can come with their kids and uh, dance. And I realize that happens at the other events as well. But until you've been to each of three of them, you don't really understand the difference. And mm-hmm. no, neither is better than the other. They're all three great and they all serve a purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, it's real credit uh, my, to the Beatles, oh. to the whole Beatles thing, that there can be so many different things going on about it, not just the festivals, but what we're doing right now. It's just an endless subject matter. Mm-hmm. Um, you were talking about the, uh, you know, starting out with Beatles bands, and in, in the intro, uh, in Ken's intro, we talked about how, uh, you know, there are Beatle bands and solo bands and even a, a Wilburys band. But um, these days, at least, you have actually other bands playing other music too. I mean, you've mm-hmm. got the Zombies this year. Um, when did um, when did you? You hadn't expanded beyond the Beatles at the very start, did you? That was a, a later development. Yeah, it, it probably happened in 07. I started a stage in 07 called the Brian Epstein stage where new music goes to get discovered. And uh, I was so excited about that idea. I mean, it's a good name, right? Mm-hmm. 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 And, Absolutely. And, and, and we booked all these regional new music bands who, you know, were influenced and had the sound that would have been either cavernish or beatle or Liverpoolish. you know, these bands were, you know, 
up and comers. And and we got a, new, a headliner out of Chicago, Ike Riley and the Assassins, who mm-hmm. a Rolling Stones writer had written that year that it was the best rock show he had seen of the year, including Bruce Springsteen. And I started following Ike Riley, and I could I understood what was really motivating the writer from Rolling Stone to say that. So I built this whole thing around Ike Riley and these other bands, and our fans totally rejected it. I was so disappointed. They just <laughs> They wouldn't leave the Beatles stages to go see this other music. But I was determined not to. I had made up my mind that we couldn't exist as 100% Beatles music, that the Beatles themselves had been influenced by everybody else, that the Beatles had influenced everybody else, and that we, we had to you know, vary the subject matter or we would just atrophy. And it was my own personal tastes along the way too, mm-hmm. and, uh, mm-hmm. and 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 uh, honestly, I'm having a blink on what we wound up doing. In uh, you know, <laughs> then we got Jefferson Starship, and right. and that you know, and that was a big move in a, in a new direction. I think we had already had Denny Lane, and we'd had I, I, I don't recall right now, but uh, once Jefferson Starship came, that kind of changed it. Everybody that had been a naysayer of doing that. And in our contracts with all of these bands, we insist that they do at least two to three Beatles songs. Mm-hmm. So Jefferson Starship happily cooperated. They had even covered their own version of Imagine once before. Mm. And then after that, it took off. You know, we did Peter Noon and Leon Russell and Peter Asher. And, you know, I guess we hit our pinnacle with the Beach Boys in in 14 and then last year the uh glenn burtnick's other band which is the weaklings the the weak- yeah. right his right. other right. band the orchestra which is the elo which is you know they are elo without jeff lynn mm. now this year the zombies felix cavalry's rascals yes the Re- right will be there this year and mm-hmm. uh, and that's what i enjoy doing i uh i like curating the whole festival i am very hands-on. I program every show. I book every band. I create every album show with the bands. I am in a 12-month conversation with all of our bands that never end. Do the other bands still have to play three Beatles songs? Oh, yeah. Like the zombies? The best story of the Beach Boys is, um, you know, we're talking about the Beach Boys who have their own catalog. Mm -hmm. And and, and, uh, when I... So I would keep every so often bringing it up to uh, the agent. He'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it was in the contract, but I didn't know if they would really, Mike Love would really go along with that when the time came. <laughs> uh, well, on Beach, Bo- Beach Boys Party, they do at least three Beatles songs. Yeah. Songs. Well, they actually, I mean, they just put out that expanded edition. I don't I don't right. remember how many songs were on it, but I mean, it the Beatles songs all over that thing. Right. They had covered a lot of Beatles songs, so I felt confident that we could get them to do it. And about a week before the event, uh, the music, uh, the tour director called me and I said, Scott, you're going to do some Beatles songs, right? And he said, just try and stop us. And that was the <laughs> best words I ever heard. And they wound up doing, you know, he had written that song for George, uh, Pisces right. Brothers. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. So he had done a whole thing around that and they did their Prudence and they talked about, he talked about his days with Prudence and they did back in the USSR. Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. on four or five songs, and it was mm-hmm. it was a bit of a happening. So, will the zombies wind up doing Beatles songs? Well, I don't know if they'll do four or five, but they uh, best do two or three. So, and I know Felix. I saw Felix recently on the Flower Power cruise, and which we were part of that, and he uh, promised me he was going to do Beatles songs. So, we'll see. They did once they get there, they get so into the spirit of it, they can't believe it. Mm-hmm. I remember Peter Noon. I mean, Peter Noon has his own, you know, show. But when he saw Abbey Road on the River, he was kind of dumbfounded, actually. He said, I've never heard of this. I can't believe this is happening. And you know he's seen lots of other Beatles types events. Sure. Right. Uh, he was kind of taken aback by our thing. What did John Sebastian do? Oh, well, yeah. So, yeah. So John did two shows. And uh, he opened for the Beach Boys outside, and he did his own indoor show. And I can't tell you what Beatles songs he sang. I really <laughs> don't remember. 
Um, okay. John was a different situation. Gretsch Guitar brought him in. Hmm. And so I didn't have a, uh, a contract with him to do Beatles songs. Uh, okay. So somebody else that calls into your show or listens it, that was there will have to tell us if he did or didn't, because I don't remember. Okay. I was so preparing for the Beach Boys that night that I didn't see anything John did. <laughs> Beach Boys okay. made me nervous. That's a big show. Yeah. Sure. What yeah. did Jefferson Starship do? Well, they did that Imagine song that right. it airs, and um, they did a huge finale with all of our bands. It was either, oh my, it was uh, either Pepper or All You Need Is Love, but all of our bands came up. They did a big finale in, in Washington and Louisville hmm. with all of the bands. They were into hmm. it. And, uh, wow. You know, and watching Paul Kantner, you know, rest in peace was... Uh, yeah. He was he was an original. I will promise you that. Hmm. And Mike Love, I just want to say this about Mike Love, just because you have a lot of people listening. Yeah. Easily, you know, the Rolling Stone story on him, I think last month was right to the point. Easily, the most misunderstood person in the history of rock and roll. Really? I mean, he's a, he is a great guy. Huh? I was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony where things went bad. Right. Uh -huh. You couldn't get off the stage. And I was 20 feet away. So I remember that night well. The Beatles, the Supremes, the mm. Beat Boys, Bob Dylan were all inducted at the same time. It was an amazing evening. And um, but when I got to work with him and meet him that night, he was just truly a gentleman and cooperative and just a great guy. And so is... Uh, Bruce Johnston. They're they're kind of amazing, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Their voices are perfect. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm a big Mike yeah. Love, and I understand why he tours the way he tours without Brian. I mean, I get it. I I know a lot of people don't, but it's it's the way it has to be. Otherwise, they wouldn't go out 200 nights a year. Yeah, exactly. Very you're not true. the only you're not the only one that said that to me about Mike Love being misunderstood. So. Well, look how long he's been putting on this great music, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got to give a guy credit. He doesn't have to do it, I don't think. Right. It's like Bruce. Yeah. It's like Springsteen, and it's like Paul and Ringo. Mm -hmm. They don't have to do it, but they, for some reason, they want to keep giving us, you know, the music we love. Mm -hmm. Right. I saw I saw the Beach Boys last year. Uh, they played a county fair close to home here, and. Um, and uh, I, as you know, as much as you can criticize Mike Love and and the group for, you know, doing being without Brian Wilson, I, I have to say that you know we enjoyed the show. We did, uh, and they played a lot of deep cuts. They didn't just play the uh, endless summer stuff. So that was yeah. So they've they've definitely you know picked up the the ball and 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 uh, they do a good show now. So, Steve, you have any questions for Gary? Yeah, uh, Gary. Um, I'm. Uh, do you have any? Uh, well, I, I got to ask. Being way out on the West Coast, the only guy on the West Coast, you have any plans to come out here uh, at some point? And um, uh, yeah, do you have any plans to come out to the West Coast or come uh, go other areas? I know you've been to Washington. You've been to. You've done Louisville. You've done Cleveland. Uh, any ch any chance you're going to come out this way? We just did Dallas Saturday, actually. We did uh, Abbey Road on the Square at the 18th. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. How'd that go? It went well. It was uh, creatively, it was a 10 on a 10 point. The attendance could have been a little bit better, but that's show business. AT&T Performing Arts Center is an, uh, an incredible complex in the middle of Dallas. I've probably used the word incredible and amazing and awesome too many times. So, <laughs> so if anybody is really recording this, don't tell me how many times I did. But, <laughs> The uh, it's where the Windspear Opera House is, which is the second biggest opera house in the country, uh, other than the Met. And uh, they contacted us back in August, and uh, they were looking for a festival to uh, bring to this complex of theirs, which is outdoor and indoor stages and plazas and this and that. And at the time, they knew that we were looking to move Abbey Road on the river, and uh, they asked us to move the whole event there for Memorial Day weekend, or at least that's the conversation we started to have. And and we knew that we couldn't leave the region we're in. 
but we agreed to do a, a one-day test run, which we just did Saturday. And we had four bands, the Jukebox, Britbeat, who are more look like look alike replica type bands, the Newbies and All You Need Is Love, who are two of the best cover bands that we work with. And then all of them together did the Love album as the finale. And mm. our presentation of the Love album, which we've now done about seven times, has become our signature piece. I mean, we we do the Love album note for note with strings and horns and every effect uh, the way you hear it on the album. And it's like 30 people on stage. And maybe if people said, why should we come to Abbey Road on the River? If you're a Beatles fan, just to see the Love album because... It is, you know, the best way to see the Beatles' music, I think, in one 90-minute piece. Mm -hmm. And this year it's a tribute to George Martin as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And uh, so, yes, Steve, to answer your question, our, our thinking now is to, we're working with Flower Power Cruise, and we're now working on another cruise that they're, they're announcing, they've just announced called Rock and Romance, and we've already booked for that. Uh, two bands. All you need is love. Who's going to do Tommy and a classic rock show and Hal Bruce, who is our all around troubadour who can do, you know, a thousand different songs. I think we're going to look at more of these one day events and these co-productions where bigger producers retain us to do a part of what they're doing. Okay. Seems to make more economic sense for us. It takes the risk out of the equation. Until you've been an outdoor music festival producer, which I've been since 1979, and I have done easily 50 major outdoor events, until you go to sleep with the fear of rain, you know, <laughs> sure. multiple times in your life, you know, you start to reach a point where if you can get rid of that risk, and I'll never be able to get completely rid of it because that's the business i'm in right and unlo unlike unlike uh, the other two big festivals for the beatles uh, the fest and and liverpool we or beetle week rather rain won't wipe them out but it will wipe us out mm -hmm. we we live on the edge it's sure. a high wire end i was going to ask you about that because what happens when it is raining and you've got all these bands scheduled outdoors do you have do you have a backup <laughs> Do you have a building to take them to where they can perform their acts? Well, we have we have our host hotel. Our headquarter hotel has a thousand person ballroom and we have the Muhammad Ali Center, which has about a 700 person ballroom. We're never going to be able to like had we lost the Beach Boys, we would have lost the Beach Boys. And, uh, it, you know, but we would have waited it out. And likewise, with any of the big acts this year, we'll wait it out. And if it reaches a point where we can't do it, which has never happened to us, and, uh, you know, with the, with the grace of the Almighty, it won't happen ever again. It'll never happen. We've had a few years ago at the beginning of the White Album, as soon as the, the show started on a Saturday night, the skies erupted. Did, did any of you see the way the skies erupted over Louisville during the Derby the other day? Mm -hmm. It was like... Yeah. It was just came out of nowhere, but this one literally shut down the event. It was that big. And we did. We moved the show inside, but it took about an hour to get reorganized. But we're pretty good at moving things around. And we do have lots of indoor stages. So one way or another, the show goes on. It's just what we lose. We don't know. But, yeah, being in the out. Look at New Orleans Jazz oh, two weeks ago, right? Did you see that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Or levitation in Aug in Austin. Did you hear about that one? No, they had, that no. They had Brian Wilson actually, and uh, they had to cancel a day before they were even set to open because of all the tornadoes that were forecast for Texas last week. And Austin mm -hmm. did wind up getting hit the next day, and it's a good thing they made the call they made because the festival site they were using was pretty much destroyed. Wow! Really. Yeah, so somebody, uh, you know, I was talking to the ticketing company that handles that event, and I, I said, somebody has deep pockets, I hope. And they said, well, they have a few festivals, but, you know, it's not a good. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Gary. Gary, do you find that um, because you have bands from outside of the U.S. that you get a lot of fans, too, coming from outside the country? We don't get a lot, but we get... 
we get an, enough to make it interesting and it's fun, you know, but it's not like the amount of fans that go to uh, Beetle Week. You know, I went to Beetle Week this year. I'm sorry to tell you for the very first time. And uh, everywhere I went, there were people speaking German. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> it, it was, uh, I mean, Beetle Week draws people from every European country for sure. Plus, um, it's hard to get to the States. You, the airfares are just so expensive right now. My daughter just moved to London in uh, January, and uh, I'm, I'm just amazed at what the cost is to go back and forth because I've been going back and forth. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not my son in law put a plug in. My son in law is the lead in the Book of Mormon on the West End in broad in uh London. Wow. Uh -huh. Pretty good. If Very ever, nice. Oh, he plays the role of Elder Price. Huh. <laughs> wow. On your uh, your Facebook page you have um f I believe it's forty reasons yeah. why uh why somebody should uh attend the 2016 Abbey Road on the River. Maybe you can give us maybe like a cust, uh, you know, uh, a capsule version of that. Yeah. Okay. I'm. Uh, I'd love to. Prudence Farrow. I think uh -huh. it's, she's going to be there because uh, I often say that uh, she's the most famous living subject of a, a song. I can't think of anybody alive who is the subject of a more famous song. Can you? Yoko. That was that was that John and Yoko. <laughs> you, you might have me on that, but which is the better song? I don't know. Okay. okay. It's like such a great mm. song, but I, I will call that one a tie. Uh, <laughs> Shannon is going to be there, and uh, she's going to be painting. And she hasn't been at Abbey Road on the River in, since Cleveland. So I'm really excited that she's coming back. She's an uh, amazing artist for anyone that has yeah. not seen her artwork. You Very look true. Look at her website too, because what she's able to do, I mean, one of my favorite things that she's done, she puts out these. Well, it's it's um, I think she calls it the six faces of, and it's of each beetle, and it's it, it it's um, a certain beetle through the years and what their faces look like, and she puts it on T-shirts and all kinds of things, and it's really wonderful the mind that she has in, in drawing she's, what she does. She's just well, incredible. I the cover of our event program, which we just put on Facebook, is one of her portraits of uh, it's the Let It Be album. Mm -hmm. And we did the cover of this year's event program that we just released the cover today with the words Let It Be because we're moving from Louisville to Jeffersonville, Indiana, across the river next year after 12 years in Louisville. Um, Joe Johnson is coming for the first time to have you wrote on the river. And that's another, uh, you know, uh, uh, friendship that I just struck up. I never met Joe until this year's Flower Power Cruise, and uh, I really enjoyed his company, and he's going to come and work, serve as an MC. We're doing a classical show on Sunday with uh, Belle Lau, who's the keyboardist of the Crier. She's going to team up with Mario De Silva, who's a pretty renowned classical guitarist, and Anna Blanton, who is uh, the first violinist in the Love Show. And uh, they're going to do a classical uh, presentation. Steve Holly will be there. And, of course, you know, he's been at a lot of different events lately. We're going to do a tribute to Yes uh, one night on uh, the main stage late, which will be fun. We're doing a show called The Wilbury Connection, which is more this year than just a tribute to the Wilburys. We'll be doing a tribute to the solo careers of Petty and Orbison and Dylan and Lynn, and there's another guy, I can't remember his name, but you know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be doing a, a tribute to the five of them as well. And uh, we have a fifth Beatle contest, which is our version of, you know, where our fans get up and play along with the different bands and, and become a member of a band. We have a ukulele ensemble that'll uh, do a bunch of, uh, you know, uke uh, presentations. We have so many different album shows we i think we have 70 album shows this year and we probably have another 50 that are themed and we have a lot of combination album shows like some of the titles i was just looking at our event program which we're getting ready to go to print on tomorrow or the next day and the uh i'll read you some of the um the mashed up albums we have <laughs> Boy, you're covering everything. Yeah. Now, we have uh, Rubber Revolver, Pepper and Beyond, 
Mm. Jim Pepper on Abbey Road, a white or white album. We'll do a concert for George, Magical Pepper, a Hard Day's Help. Hard Day's Help is a one is a guy named J.R. McNeely, who's a session musician and uh, audio engineer in Nashville, and uh, he's pretty pretty talented. And uh, he created his own one man show this year that he's he's put on film, and he plays six different instruments. And so he'll be in the Muhammad Ali Center in the main auditorium. And what he put on film will be backing him up live. And so he'll be the only person we'll see, but we'll see six JRs on the screen behind him. And the show will be, you know, seamlessly engineered and called a hard day's help. And then we have tributes to Paul and to George and John. We have one band is doing Venus and Mars at the speed of sound. Another is doing Wings Over America. John Keats, who you all know from the Cavern, is doing Double Fantasy and Imagine. We're doing the Deca tapes in the Cavern rehearsals. We have a lot of variety. <laughs> I mean, I think we're doing the Abbey Road album. Six different bands are doing the Abbey Road album. Wow. Wow. And, and, and I know that, you know, so the albums that we're doing for sure, Abbey Road, Rubber Soul, Revolver, A Hard Day's Night, Let It Be, Yesterday and Today, With the Beatles, Let It Be Naked, Past Masters, Volume 2, Beatles 6, Magical Mystery Tour, Beatles for Sale, The White Album, The Number One Album, Pepper, Please Please Me, The Blue Album, Yellow Submarine. Those will all be done complete more than once. <laughs> Maybe that's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. What made you choose um, Jeffersonville, Indiana, for the new site? Well, we kind of threw down the gauntlet last uh, May when the event ended and said we're leaving because for a lot of reasons. The the site had become uh, had some structural issues. It had become expensive to do it at that site. We had some conflicts with the hotel that was attached to the site that we were in business with. And uh, I just reached a point like where I needed some change. So I just said we're leaving, and I because I had a hunch the phone would ring, and I knew we could do it at Cleveland at Nautica, no matter what, because we have a relationship with them. So I just figured it was time to look around, and uh, I did a tour. I mean, I I looked at I looked hard at Atlantic City, believe it or not. I loved Atlantic City, and while a lot of people told me I was nuts, I came close to pulling the trigger on Atlantic City. Um, I looked in Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, Knoxville. Dallas, of course, and uh, but Jeffersonville, this little town, it's kind of the equivalent of maybe what Covington is to Cincinnati. It's right across the river. Uh, <laughs> you guys aren't from this part, but maybe it would be, you know, distance-wise, Brooklyn to Manhattan, and <clears throat> uh, and it's a hip little town that's doing a lot of things, and they just built a pedestrian bridge that connects the two towns. And the bridge is drawing 10, 15,000 people a weekend that in the summer that walk across this bridge or ride their bikes across it. And they called us and uh, they had just built this new park called Big Four Station Park. And they already had a floating stage on the river. <laughs> and uh, they basically made us an offer we couldn't refuse. And it was uh, <laughs> something that we tried to refuse for a couple of months. And uh, from the mayor on down, they kept coming back at us and proving their sincerity for the project. Uh, they just really believed that we could grow it even more by taking over the entire town and really being the, the proverbial big fish in a small pond as opposed to the other way around. And, and in Louisville itself, in the heart of Louisville, I've been thinking for a while that there's too few dollars chasing too much entertainment. And since they built the Yum Center, especially, which is where Paul played in uh, a year ago, October, it's changed things because, you know, Bruce is there and Paul is there and Justin Bieber was just there. And it takes millions of dollars out of the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, selling tickets, no matter who you are in this business, selling tickets, you know, it, it's what they say in the movie. Uh, what was the baseball movie where they said it's not beanbag? You know, it's a. Uh, it's it's hard to sell tickets. You gotta be you, Steve. You follow my stuff, so you know how hard mm -hmm. I aggressively market this festival. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, so was your was your audience um, that significantly local? Uh, my impression was that it mainly was a destination that people went to from elsewhere. 
Yeah. We're actually about 80% local. Really? Hmm. It's wow. that the 20% that travel are spend a lot of money. They buy a more expensive ticket. They stay for four, five, six days. We have several populations that we cater to, and we especially cater to that population. And uh, we, we really love our travel business. And I, I personally uh, sold every ticket to this festival when it began. I took every phone order for the first six or seven, seven years maybe, till we started to become a little bit more electronic. And then we, in 10, we finally went completely digital with Eventbrite. But so I got to know people and really practiced one-on-one -on -one retail with my customers. And, uh, you know, there's good and bad that goes with that. Sometimes, you know, you, you uh, under deliver and then you really disappoint people who, you know, know you. But uh, it's probably, you know, every day, if I get an email from a customer, I, I try to return it in less than a minute. I do that all day long. I'm constantly responding to customers. And that 20% who travels, I feel that the money they spend is their vacation money. It's their most important money. And that's why we started the 21 and under free program for their kids. We did that especially so people who had 15 year olds wouldn't have to leave them home Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. But we do a lot of local business. We are a local music festival. That's why staying in the region was so important to me. Otherwise, mm -hmm. Steve, to your point, it would have been just as easy to pick up and try to do it in San Diego or San Francisco because with the thinking that the travel business would follow us anywhere, but we really draw from a 350 mile radius uh, mm -hmm. the most people who get in their cars and drive here. Right. It's a so how many people, a how many people are we talking about every year? Well, you know, when a guy comes for five days, you count him five times. Uh -huh. So in terms of the amount of times the turnstile clicks, it's mm -hmm. in the range of 25,000. Okay. And so that's a lot. On Saturday, we do between eight and 10,000 people on that one day. And on Sunday, we do in the range of five to six. And then on Friday, we'll do four. And then on Thursday and Monday, the difference. But, you know, we're always in the uh, 23 to 5, 25,000 range. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's hard to break through that. We have not, we've not been able to break through that. But, you know, I, we, we watch our pennies. We spend our money smartly. We, you know, count every dollar and uh, we're profitable. Mm -hmm. Gary, what's the process like in picking all the different Beatles tribute bands? Because there's so many of them out there and um, each one is different in their own way. And the kind of material that they'll cover, whether they dress up like the Beatles, whether they just dress casually. And everyone is different that's out there. You must stay on top of a lot of this stuff. Do you get solicited with tons of material? I get a lot. And, I get and, a lot. Probably get uh, 100, 150 new inquiries a year at least. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, I would always measure them by two songs, Help and Nowhere Man. And they had to send me their version of Help or Nowhere Man. And, <laughs> and the way my ear works, I could size them up immediately on that. Now, whether I was right or wrong, I don't know. But people have always told me, our customers always tell me I have a good ear. I'm not musical. I can't play one note of anything. I'm tone deaf. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I have no knack. I have no skills for anything. And people who know me know that to be true. I'm not being self-deprecating. I can't do anything. I can't assemble things. I can't figure problems out. But I do have an ear for this type of stuff, and I have a, an ability to curate it and put it into a form that people like. And I stay at it. I work at it really hard to make sure that I try to cross every T. So then when they, what happens then is when you hear the really good ones, the really good ones, you can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go out of your way to make a deal. Because, you know, economics is at the heart of each one of these arrangements. So sometimes you just have to pass because they're coming from Argentina and the dollars just aren't going to work. Uh, but we've been, I'd have to say we're 90% successful in getting every band we, we've ever wanted. 
I'd love to have the Fab Four, as an example, come every year. We've only had them once. I do place them very high on the charts of one of the great replica bands. But they've really made their bones, and they're playing big gigs, and they're, they've become out of our price range. And that's okay. You know, we're, we just you got to be able to make commerce and art meet at the same place. Mm-hmm. But, uh, uh-huh. you know, there can be some bad wigs and boots bands, as you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so I'm thankful. <laughs> and one of the reasons we've evolved into so many cover bands is because especially the bands who come from Europe, they hold up. As, as good a rock and roll bands as I've ever seen, you know, on the arena circuit. They're great. And uh, in their own hometown, they are the number one band in the area. Do you look for bands that really nail the songs and copy them just like the Beatles did? Or do you look more for artists who would do their own arrangements? I, I'd say I probably lean more now to what pushes my button the most is when I hear new arrangements. When I hear women doing it, when I hear bigger ensemble pieces of it, when I hear that they have an accordion in the group, you know, it's it's any little thing that's different is what gets my attention. Because I'm always looking to give the audience uh, an an interpretation of the Beatles music that they haven't seen anymore while remaining faithful to the, you know, the subject. You know, we just did love this weekend in Dallas and... I was mesmerized, mesmerized that we do this show. I hadn't seen it in a couple of years now because we hadn't done it in a couple of years. And I just thought to myself, this is the best Beatles concert there is. There's nothing better. Nobody, not the Fab Faux, apologies to Will and Rich and the boys, nobody. (laughs) Nobody does a a Beatles concert that is the equivalent of our love. And, uh, I mean, if, if, if Sir Paul or Ringo could see it, they wouldn't believe it. It's that good. But Anybody else have a question? Well, I think even though it's not your main focus, maybe we should talk about some of the um, lectures and, and spoken things that you've got this year. Mm-hmm. Um, I see Bruce is doing his touring um, uh, yesterday and today lecture which we know about. Um, Bruce Spizer. Prudence Farrow is Bruce speaking. Spizer. Yeah. She's going to be speaking for three days. She's okay. Gonna and Julia Baird. Julia will be there all weekend long with the Cavern. And uh, she's going to do story. Her lectures are going to be John Lennon, the poet. I'm, I'm looking mm. forward to that, uh, that particular uh, interpretation from her because she was there once before, but, you know, I don't know if they really discussed it from that angle of John as the poet, and I think it's going to be really well received. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm excited about that. And Bruce, of course, is going to do the butcher cover, you know, right. too. So, you know, so it's just, yeah, well, that's what you said. But so I'm looking forward to that. And we have a new Beatles historian who's just kind of come on the scene, Aaron Krierowitz. Mm-hmm. And Aaron is young, he's only 25 or 26, and he's really become a devout researcher of the subject. And he's got Oh, 10 or 15 different lectures that he's doing in libraries around the Midwest. And at our event, he's doing the White Album, and um, I'm blanking on what the other one is. Oh, uh, the the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Yeah, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. I'm scrolling through the schedule, and uh, my eyes are popping, are popping out. This is just amazing. The amount of the amount of uh, uh, the number of events, and uh, oh, it's just uh, it's it's amazing, <laughs> it really is. It is when when we put it takes about four months to do the schedule. We start on the schedule and uh, at the end of December, and you start on an Excel spreadsheet with all of their names, and then you start the process of assigning them to stages and times and avoiding conflicts and making sure that. You know, you're not doing a hard day's night, two bands at the same time, and and then different bands team up and form ensembles with other bands, which has become a big byproduct of Abbey Road on the River, that they all like to play with each other. And so it becomes this amazing jigsaw puzzle, and they drive me crazy, but sometime around end of March, I get it done, and uh, I, it is fun to look at. If you sort it on the schedule, if you roll your mouse over any of the names, you can go to like a hyperlink for just album and then you click it 
and you'll see all the album shows. Or you go to another hyperlink that says theme, and it'll pull up all the shows by theme. And it's mm-hmm. fun to see it that way. Uh, we just the print version will be online in a couple of days. Uh, it's a 20-page program, and uh, it'll be online. And when, just now, I'm sitting here looking at it, and that's mind-boggling. When you look at it in print, it's. I always worry about our customers that they're going to look at it and go, "I don't know where to go." Yeah. I don't <laughs> yes. I experience well, that all the time at the Fest for Beetle fans. This is even on right. a grander scale, so. It's I always I mean, people are coming up to me at the festival all the time and saying, "Hey, I, I hate you. I can't believe you did this to me. I don't know where to go. I don't know what. Yeah. To, <laughs> I can't focus." But we have. Mm-hmm that way it's not a question of more being better but it is a question of you know quantity and quality and and if we only did you know one stage abbey road on the river just wouldn't be you know the event we're talking about right now right yeah who were some of the special guests in the past that you would say were the most interesting because i know i was there in uh 2010 and you had pete best there and he was wonderful yeah pete we've had the year in Washington, Pete was a bit of a phenomenon. I was amazed at how people waited in line to meet Pete. It was something. One year we did a uh, seminar with uh, Peter Noon, Peter Asher, Tony Bramwell, Orange Juber, and um, who the heck was the other guy? <laughs> uh, Denny Lane, and that was really well received. Frida Kelly may have been. And you guys know this because you know how. Oh yeah! Yes. Oh yes! Absolutely. The fans love Frida Kelly, and uh, yeah, <laughs> she's she's fantastic. I know. She's... I I I didn't. I knew she'd be great, and we really fought to get her. We got her the second time around. We couldn't get her the first year when the the film came out, but she came and she did about five lectures or conversations, and they were always full, totally full, and. Everybody wanted to meet her. We, you know, we've had Louise Harrison. We're about to make some big announcements for 17. What we're doing this year for 17 with Jeffersonville is um, we're going to announce about 10 headliners the week of Abbey Road this year. And we are really stepping on the gas with big names from the era, like the ones we were talking about earlier in the conversation. We're going to announce a much bigger lineup so that our customers know that this move to Jeffersonville is uh, serious and that we're planning to expand the festival, not make it smaller. And uh, Steve, you'll be one of the first to know, I'm sure. Thank you, Gary. Are you guys going to stream or is it going to be streamed? I don't know yet. Um, Mm. We did, we did Dallas uh, through a Facebook app that they had the other day. I, I was thinking of trying Periscope. I haven't. Uh, what do you all think? Um, it, I haven't. It's, I haven't used Periscope. Um, it's it's, it's tough. Yeah, it's it, tough. You it's know, tough. Plus, our fans. Everybody's posting videos almost in real time. Yeah. <laughs> but the only be, thing. The only thing about the YouTube stuff is it usually isn't very good. You know, right. I mean, it's in terms of quality and and having a stream would be would be a better. Uh, a better mark on the on the festival you know it'd be it, i think better for the festival if you can do that i know that's hard yeah um, the fest ones were never that great right um, exactly but yeah. you know it's still still it would be better if you could stream it i mean because i don't think anybody would ca- would would care after the fact um that much i mean the the immediacy of having the stuff online if you can't get there is you know, would be great, and um, I think would do, you know, would do a lot in spreading the word. Um, so cool. even if you just even if you just did a limited stream, you know, maybe uh, an hour or two rather than do the whole thing. I think that's the way to. I think that's a good idea and a good suggestion. I think that's what yeah. I'm making notes right now, and I'm gonna. Talk. <laughs> <laughs> and and of course, looking at this lineup, what do you stream? There's so much. Right. Yeah, you there know, you go. It's <laughs> the number one album that the Jukebox does on Friday night is a, is really great because Jukebox from San Juan is probably one of the very best uh, Beatle bands in the world. They're the most certainly the most energetic and fan popular. They're just 
four crazy, talented, handsome guys from San Juan that everybody loved. And they've got Mark Beyer, who's the rain keyboardist, as their keyboardist for the number one show. And so when you see the number one show, like the love show, is pretty special because every song on it is was number one. So I'm good at redundancies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got I gotta say, Gary, I I've, I've seen All You Need Is Love out here when they played the uh, Northern California Festival, and they were awesome. They were fan. I loved All You Need Is Love. They were great. Their lead um, guitarist and the the leader of the group, his name is Mark Rashad. Mark mm-hmm. is now. The lead guitarist, he's he's our age, or I'm assuming you guys are over age 40. Mark is up. Uh, yes. He's yeah, up. a little. Now, he's, now, <laughs> he's the lead guitarist now in Jake Clemens' band because Mark owns a theater in Belleville, Ontario called The Empire, and Jake came and played that theater, and Jake knew, saw that Mark had this vast guitar collection and invited Mark to play on one song, and Mark now is Jake's lead guitarist or they just finished an album and he's now become jake's manager and you know who jake is yes no is uh, clarence's nephew right and and so mark is now kind of like you know getting close to that whole circle but he does the while my guitar gently weeps guitar solo with another great guitarist called jeff perholz and together they do seven minutes of that guitar piece and yes, you're right. The, all you need is love. These guys are, uh, they could have been anything. They just happened to stop touring in their when, in their 30s and settle down and do regular jobs. But they never stopped playing. They never stopped practicing. And uh, they keep getting better. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they were, they were the highlight of the what I saw when they played the um, the fest that was not it wasn't the it wasn't the Lapidus event it was a, it was a Beatles radio right no uh, I remember it, when they did that when when Beatles radio mm-hmm. did that yeah I do remember mm-hmm. that it was and yeah that was the first year they were they were fantastic they really were well it's funny you see how many other events like ours have started and stopped it's it's uh it's not easy it it's uh there is no business that's you know a slam dunk but. I think this one, again, having produced music festivals for all of my life, I find this one uh, to be the most challenging. It's been the most rewarding in terms of the amount of people that I've met and the the goodwill that we've extended to so many families that have really marked their whole year by Abbey Road on the River. I mean, the one byproduct of this event that I never expected was how many real-time friendships people would make with each other from all over the country. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And in many cases, for a lot of people that were already empty nesters and didn't have uh, a lot of opportunities to meet new people again, have now not only made friends at this event, but they see each other all the time and they're going to other events and concerts together. So I'm always gratified by that, that they're going to talk about Abbey Road on the River. And I know that's true of the fest as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. He's got 40 years of doing this, and and that's that to me is a a super accomplishment. I am in awe of 40 years of doing this. Uh So uh, again, if he's listening, congratulations. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, chat about Abbey Road and the river and it's all, and and everybody, you know, there's a lot of fans out there. There really, there really is. So, and for a lot of people, the only time they get to see each other as friends are at these Beatle events like yours. Yeah, so. very true. Well, we're all connected just to our computers. We don't go out. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> we have no life. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's right. Yeah. It's just it's the, right. the world that we live in. And uh, so it is nice when you see Rahm Emanuel came to Abbey Road on the River in Washington. And uh, the whole it was when he was chief of staff for the uh, president. And I was walking around with him, and he said, I haven't seen many this many boy 13 year old boys dance with their mothers since their bar mitzvahs <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just love funny. because it was the fact you know it's a place where 13 year old boys will dance with their mothers sure that's funny <laughs> and how many how many bands can you say that about <laughs> I, 
I, I've often thought of who else I could do an event around. And uh, I'll leave you with this to ponder. The only other artist on earth that I could imagine a festival evolving around similar to this would be Stephen Sondheim. So Uh-oh. That, that'll give you some <laughs> <laughs> You have to be the, the total king of your art form to have yeah. there be a festival that celebrates you. You can't be tied for first. You must be first. And, and the Beatles are not tied for first. The Stones aren't the Beatles. The Beach Boys aren't the Beatles. The Bee Gees aren't the Beatles. You know, we go on and on and on. Uh -huh. Nobody else can have an art form around them other than the Beatles. And uh, so. Well, I know Alan is speechless by your comment. Yes. Right there, but, uh, no, I, I like Stephen Sondheim. You don't or you do? I do. Yeah. I, uh, I do. There's a huge difference. We, you know, they're they're referring to my um, general contempt for Andrew Lloyd Webber, and think that applies to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, uh, right. But Steve, I said, Sondheim, Sondheim is great. Right. Sondheim's different because he's he's more of a. Oh, yeah. poet. He's but, an actual musician. <laughs> so I'm. Uh, but I'm not thinking. I'm, I'm. I'm not planning that one just yet. Who would have thought when I mentioned the twentieth, and then when I started in O two. Who would have thought that they'd be more popular today than at any other point in their careers? The Beatles are bigger now than they've ever been. And it'll mm -hmm. continue like that, apparently, for a long time. Yeah. I certainly feel that way, but I think a lot of people will debate that point. But, well, but they're not our listeners. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Heck, so why? Even at, at, the, at the new Coachella, who's the guy that they had to have to make it work? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it's without him, it's uh, it's OK, but you're not getting the same buzz. All right. Well, right? we've we've pretty much run out of time here, Gary. It has been great having you as a guest. And I want to remind everybody that the uh, Abbey Road on the River Festival coming up is happening May 26th through the 30th at Belvedere Festival Park in Louisville, Kentucky. If you want more information, you can go to their own website. For the festival it's a r o t r dot com all right and if you would like to get in touch with us you can do so by writing to us at our email address which is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com we also have our own facebook page for things we said today um steve if people want to get in touch with you they can do so how uh, Beatles Examiner at gmail.com or I'm on Facebook uh, in several places on my own page and I also have a Beatles news and, and commentary group that I um, will talk about uh, or to, uh, that I respond to uh, all the time so there we go and Al how about you uh, on Facebook uh, Al Sussman uh, on Twitter at A-S-U-S-S -S, uh, 4 9 uh, and through www.beetlefan.com. Okay, Alan, people want to get in touch with you, how? How can they do so? Um, probably, probably the best thing is Facebook, um, where you can find me either as Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, my alter ego. Um, and there you go. And as for me, Ken Michaels, you can uh, contact me at my email address at everylittlething at att.net. <laughs> I do want to uh, point out that I have a website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. And just for a few seconds, I want to mention a couple of things on the website because uh, Jenny Lane, who Gary just mentioned several times here, will be doing a number of concerts on the East Coast of the U.S., and he'll be performing the entire Band on the Run album. And if you want to see a list of all the dates where he's performing, I do have a concert and events page on my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And I also have a special contest going which is starting right around the time when people will first be able to hear this, which uh, is the new Billy J. Kramer autobiography called Do You Want to Know a Secret? I have copies of that to give away. Find out how on my website. All the information is there on the homepage at KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right, Gary, anything else you want to add before we go? Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you, Gary. Thank, Thank you, you, Gary. Thank you. Fun. Anytime I get to talk about myself for an hour. I mean. <laughs> okay. Hope to see you at Abbey Road on the River, if not on Facebook. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Good night. Take care.
And on behalf of Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, Alan Kozen, and Gary Jacob, I'm Ken Michaels, thanking all of you for listening, and I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.